Great. So the event is now being recorded. Uh, again, thank you for your permission there. And welcome again. We are very excited here at the Arctic Initiative to kick off a hybrid event here uh, safely. If the Arctic Initiative addresses the challenges associated with rapid climate change in the Arctic. And today's event is going to be focusing uh, on a conversation about science, diplomacy, and geopolitics with Arctic Initiative Senior Fellow Fran Ulmer and Professor and Director of the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire, Professor Larry Mayer. Uh, to introduce uh, our first speaker, Fran Ulmer, Sarah Amish, a research assistant with the Arctic Initiative, will provide an introduction to Fran. Then Fran will turn things over to Professor uh, Mayer to talk about uh, the just completed cruise, uh, as well as a discussion on uh, the Northwest Passage uh, going forward. We will again uh, be taking questions in this hybrid format in person and on Zoom. So for any of the Zoom participants, you may go ahead and uh, submit your questions over the chat. We will then uh, save a portion of the discussion at the end of the event and alternate between any in-room and Zoom questions. Without further ado, I will turn it over to Sarah for the introduction of Fran. Excellent. Thank you, Danny. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Fran to this event. Um, she's had quite the career, and so uh, bear with me as I work through her long list of accomplishments. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give the abbreviated version. Okay. Uh, so Fran Omer has been involved in a multitude of things. So she has been an elected official for 18 years, ranging from mayor of Juneau through state representative and then culminating in lieutenant governor of Alaska. Uh, she worked as legal counsel for the Alaskan legislature, um, legislative assistant, director of policy development. Uh, and then she has also been on the first chair of the Alaska Coastal Policy Council and then served for more than 10 years in the North Pacific Andronomous Fish Commission. Um, and Fran earned her JD cum laude from the University of Wisconsin Law School and has been a fellow at the IOP here at HKS. Thank you, Sarah, for keeping it short. Appreciate it. Uh, really wonderful to be here in person at Harvard and actually have people in the room. This is my first hybrid event. It's wonderful. And for all of you who have joined us today, thank you very much. This is a wonderful opportunity to hear from Professor Larry Mayer about his recent cruise and also to understand the geopolitical significance as well as the scientific significance of this cruise. Before we listen to Larry, I just want to set the stage just a little bit about Arctic matters, because although some of you are very familiar with the Arctic, matter of fact, you've lived in the Arctic, some of the people on the call today may not be. So uh, if you would go ahead and advance the slide, I just want to point out that the, the particular trip that Larry took, which started in Nome and ended in Greenland, is a huge territory, but it's a very small part of the Arctic. Uh, as we must remember the Arctic, you may advance the slide, is an ocean surrounded by eight countries. And those eight countries, each of them have their own laws and regulations and policies and priorities and agendas. And so when you're talking about the Arctic, it's really important to remember that this is a complicated place. There's not just one Arctic, there are literally many Arctics, and it is a unique space for many reasons. Of the 4 million people who live in the Arctic, many are indigenous. And the indigenous people each have their own language, own culture, own traditions, and many different ways in which they use the natural resources of the region. Very specialized ecosystems, boreal forests and permafrost and tundra. And let's admit this, a place where ice, snow, cold, dark winters, very light summers, create a very specialized ecosystem, which means, of course, that all of the animals, all the birds, all the fish, and even the people in the culture have evolved consistent with those very specialized ecosystems. 
governance, as I mentioned before, it's in the hands of the eight countries. So unlike Antarctica, one overarching treaty, no. The Arctic is exactly the opposite. Yes, there are some treaties, and Larry will speak to some of them, that really matter, but you have many, many decision makers in the Arctic. The economies are quite diverse as well, from oil and gas and mining on the one hand to fishing and tourism on the other. And I would say, as the Arctic is warming, there is much more interest in those economies. You may advance the slide. So again, just very basically, the Arctic is changing dramatically. The Arctic of today is very different than the Arctic of yesterday. And much of that is driven by warmer temperatures, by retreating glaciers and sea ice, certainly by the evolution of both the ecosystems, the cultures, and the economies. And as a result of the sense that the Arctic is opening up, there is much more human activity and much more geopolitical interest. You may advance the slide. So the increased economic activity, uh, we could talk about a number of these, but in the interest of time, I just want to focus on shipping for a minute because it is what is directly relevant to Larry's presentation. Next slide, please. When we, are talk when we talk about shipping in the Arctic really potentially being a game changer, the answer is maybe it will be and maybe it won't, but right now, Russia is very much actively promoting the Northern Sea Route as an alternative to the Suez or the Panama. Now, most people would say, not in my lifetime. But I would say that Russia is moving forward in a pretty aggressive way to create the kind of infrastructure and legal regime to improve the opportunity anyway for increased shipping. And there is more shipping. North America, well, the Northwest Passage above, above Canada is exactly what Larry's going to talk about because that was his route. But I just want to point out there are some choke points and the one that for those of us who live in Alaska, very concerned about the Bering Strait, that narrow, narrow piece of water between Alaska and Russia, where many of the shipping routes uh, that are currently considered viable would need to go. Next slide, please. I would say many of the things that need to be done to increase safety and reduce risk for places just like the Bering Strait, but really throughout the Arctic region is work, some of which is being done and much of it is still to be done in terms of increased communication capacity, increased hydrography and navigation aids and charting. And that brings us to the US Coast Guard including the icebreaker that is the hero of the day. Next slide, please. The Healy. And it is the Healy that was the platform for the trip that Larry will tell us about, but it is also the platform for most of the Arctic Ocean research that the U.S. government does. It is also what we rely on for things like search and rescue and fisheries enforcement and a whole host of other U.S. Coast Guard responsibilities. It is our one medium-class icebreaker that is assigned to the U.S. Arctic, and it's over 20 years old, and it desperately needs replacement. But thank goodness we have it, and thank goodness the U.S. Coast Guard personnel do a lot of tender, loving care to keep it operational. Next slide, please. So I, in summary, just want to kind of leave you with these thoughts. The Arctic is changing dramatically. Those changes are really important both to the people of the region, but also to the world because of the way in which Arctic climate change impacts global climate change. The adaptation that needs to take place both for villages and for infrastructure in the region is considerable and really requires a lot of the kind of science and technology innovation that Larry will talk about, at least in part today. And because the area is becoming more accessible, because more countries and, and governments and companies are interested in this region, there are many geopolitical implications associated with this changing region. 
So without further ado, that ends my slides, and I want to turn it over to Larry Mayer. Larry, Larry, in addition to being an oceanographer and the director of the University of New Hampshire's Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping, has been a leader for the National Academies, has conducted many, many research studies, over 90 Arctic cruises, 70 months at sea. I mean, the extent to which he has spent time in the Arctic on ships doing research is pretty amazing. I had the opportunity to serve with Larry on the US Arctic Research Commission for a number of years. And I know that Larry not only knows this region, but he knows the people and the treaties and the laws and many of the interesting challenges that lie ahead. So Larry, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for all that you have contributed to Arctic research. And without further ado, take it away. Well, th thank you so much, Fran. It, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here. And I thank you for all you've done. It was just wonderful serving on the Arctic Research Commission uh, with you. Um, and I certainly learned so much from you. Um, Fran has asked me to talk about uh, this recent trip of the Healy through the Northwest Passage, which I had the, the privilege of being a uh, chief scientist on. And I think in the course of this discussion, I'll try to bring in some of the geopolitical issues and some of the science issues that, that uh, Fran mentioned, but only very briefly because we just have a, a small amount of time. Before I do that though, I, I wanna try to set the, the context and provide a little background uh, that might explain why I was there and, and why we had a science program there, um, because this was a, this was quite a different type of trip for the Healy. It wasn't a sponsored science program as most of our missions were. As Fran mentioned, I've spent uh, an awful lot of time uh, on ships. Uh, um, I've had ten cruises on the Healy as chief scientist, and uh, three on the Swedish icebreaker Odin, and one on a wonderful 71-foot uh, sailboat, which really was science. It wasn't a vacation up in northern Greenland, and I'll explain what we were doing on those uh, Swedish, and uh, that was a Swedish sailboat too, cruises uh, in a minute. What I tend to bring to those cruises is uh, the technology with a, a great team that I have to, to map the seafloor in really uh, great detail. And people have been mapping the seafloor for literally thousands of years. On the left, a picture of a, from a statue from an Egyptian tomb with the, the, the Egyptian ocean mapper here with a hunk of lead at the end of the rope. Um, and they would throw that out and measure how deep it was. Well, that technology basically didn't change for almost 4,000 years, right up to the, to the early 1940s. The only way we had to map the depth of the ocean was with a hunk of lead at the end of a rope. And sometime between the wars really uh, further developed during the Second World War, the, the concept of the echo sounder was developed, taking advantage of the fact that sound can travel so wonderfully in water when light can't. And the idea of just putting out a sound and measuring how long it takes to come there and back. If we know the speed of sound in the in the water, which we do, or we can measure, we can get an idea of how deep the ocean is a lot more quickly than with a hunk of lead at the end of the rope and a lot more accurately. But those echo sounders that were developed uh, at that time, what we call single beam echo sounders, uh, have one interesting aspect and that's that the instrument that puts it out, what we call a transducer, puts out a wide cone of sound. It's small at the ship, and it just gets wider and wider as it moves to the seafloor, much like uh, a flashlight. If you take a flashlight, it starts with a little small surface, but by the time it reaches a wall far away, uh, that illuminated area gets larger, and the further you are away, the larger that area gets. Same with the sound, with the single beam echo sounder. And so we will insonify on the seafloor something like half of the water depth. So if you're in 4,000 meters or 12,000 feet of water, you'll insonify a mile all at once, and you'll have no angular resolution in there. You can't tell what's coming back from where in that circle of sound. You just get one depth that you can only assume is coming from below the seafloor. So what we end up getting from these systems is, is a rather blurry picture of what the seafloor looks like. And if we would take this single beam uh, echo sounder record and display it with modern visualization techniques, this is what a 200 by 200 kilometer area of the seafloor would look like. Not very uh, interesting, really. 
Um, so we don't use that kind of technique to display these data. We tend to use what we call contra maps. And here's, I was a graduate student at Scripps and we ships would leave from Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego with these single beam echo sounders. And then you kind of connect the dots of the, of the blurry picture and draw these contours. And in the year 2000, this was really the best depiction we had of what the seafloor off Southern California looked like. Well, about 30 years ago, a uh, really remarkable technology evolved, what we call multi-beam echo sounding. This came out of the military. And what this lets us do is instead of just one big cone of sound, it lets us put hundreds of laser-like beams of sound across a wide swath all at once. And so what we can get are literally hundreds of individual depth measurements, highly accurate vertically, highly accurate horizontally across a swath that's something like three to five times the water depth. So again, if we're in 4,000 meters, 12,000 feet of water, we'll get something like 20 kilometers all at once with hundreds of individual measurements. And this really revolutionized, revolutionized the way we can look at the seafloor. If we take that same 200 by 200 kilometer piece of seafloor and run one multi-beam swath over it, we change that to that. And as you can see, that just totally changes what we can see. We can start seeing re features that give us indications of ocean processes, and it just changed the world. It revolutionized the, our way to look at the seafloor. If we go back to our uh, map of Southern California, our best map in the year 2000, a colleague and I from the USGS spent a couple of months out there with multi-beam sonars and can turn that map into this map. And again, just this amazing new perspective of what's going on in the seafloor, of looking at processes, looking at canyons, movement of sediment, all sorts of things. And this opens up, as it says, many new insights and many new applications. And that's the background I wanted you to, to have to understand what I spend my time in the Arctic doing. So one of those applications is our ability to take a look in this detail now with mapping data at the interaction of glaciers or the ice with the seafloor. And so all those cruises on the Swedish uh, vessels, which have been up in uh, Northern Greenland, in these fjords, uh, Peterman Glacier, Ryder Glacier, where they come out into the ocean, um, we have been looking, we have been mapping there and looking at the seafloor to try to understand the history of the Greenland ice sheet because the Greenland ice sheet has been melting very, very fast. And we're trying to understand the processes. Obviously, atmospheric warming controls some of that, but that's not the whole story. As a matter of fact, a much larger portion of that story probably has to do with the ability of warm waters to come in and get in contact with that glacier, they work their way up, that eventually work their way up to, to Greenland in the, the bathymetry that has some control over, uh, over whether those waters can interact with the ice. And so we've had these cruises up there on the Swedish icebreaker to some of the most gorgeous places in the world. I'll try to uh, have a few pretty pictures in this too to, to give you the, 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 the sense of, of just how spectacular it is up there. Um, but what we try to do is go in there and in areas that have literally never been visited, never been mapped before, um, kind of remove all that bothersome water, uh, carefully maneuver around whatever ice is up there and then use these multi-beam echo sounders to map the seafloor. Um, and you'll see as the, as the surface goes away, you'll see this uh, image of the seafloor here in one of the uh, fjords. This is a Sherd Osborne Fjord, Ryder Glacier. Um, and it lets us actually read the bottom and we can see where the glacier has moved out and stopped and we can date that and try to put together the history. We can also see where warm waters have passages that might let them in and interact with the glacier. So that's one sense of what we've been doing to try to read that history uh, of the Greenland ice sheet uh, through mapping. But the other application, and this is the one that's kept me busy on the Healy all the time, is our mapping and support of a potential US submission for what's called an extended continental shelf under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. And this is a very, very complicated thing, this, this spectacular constitution of the oceans um, that, that has applicability to all sorts of, of ocean related issues in terms of freedom of navigation and marine research and, and things like that. There is one little article, just 617 words that have the audacity, I call it the audacity of the lawyers to redefine the definition of a continental shelf from a geologic definition that, that, that I know 
to a juridical, a legal definition. And that juridical continental shelf, once it's established, um, this article provides a mechanism for the coastal state to extend its sovereign rights over the resources of the seabed and subsoil, uh, subsoil of that continental shelf well beyond 200 nautical miles, uh, if the topography allows it, um, which every coastal state is entitled to. And it's a really complicated thing. I actually come to Harvard uh, Law School uh, each year and give about a three hour lecture all about just the process of doing this. But the bottom line is that to establish this, what we call extended continental shelf, the area, the limits of our sovereign rights beyond 200 nautical uh, miles, a coastal state has to demonstrate that the region is a natural prolongation of its continental landmass. Now that's not defined. This is the wonderful creative ambiguity that lawyers lead uh, uh, use during a treaty negotiation, but it does provide a mechanism to define the limits of this natural prolongation. And they're determined by the depth and the shape of the seafloor, the thickness of the underlying sediment and distances from the territorial sea baselines. But the bottom line is, to do this, you have to go out and map the seafloor. And that's what those nine cruises on the Healy uh, were all about. Um, over the course of uh, 15, 16 years, we did all the little, the bright stuff here you see, uh, mapping from the Healy, which has one of these multi-beam uh, sonars on it. We mapped about 442,000 square kilometers. And while I can't show you yet the result of what that meant with respect to the extended continental shelf for the US. I can show you a desktop study we did in 2002 that looked at the, the little bit of existing data we had at that time and said where a potential extended continental shelf might go. And you can see here is the 200 nautical mile EEZ. And at that time we thought the extended continental shelf could go as far as this hundreds and hundreds of miles beyond uh, the 200 nautical mile EEZ. And again, this will be uh, made public uh, relatively soon but I can tell you that we weren't that far off in our early prediction. And so there's a tremendous area which we can extend our sovereign rights. And so that's what I was doing for all those nine cruises on the Healy before this last one this summer. Well, the last ECS cruise we had was in about 2016. And since that time, I've watched with great interest the uh, US government, really increasing interest in Greenland. I won't show headlines about uh, buying Greenland, but you see that we opened the consulate there and we have enough, lots of uh, foreign aid packages now. And because of that, I wasn't surprised when the Coast Guard announced uh, in 2019 that they wanted to bring the Healy to Greenland. And I guess because of all my experience on the Healy and the fact that I've been working off Greenland uh, between 2016 and 2019 on the Swedish icebreakers, I was asked if I could uh, serve as uh, the chief scientist uh, on this cruise. Now, Healy is home ported in Seattle. And if you want to get to Greenland, there are two sensible ways. You could go all the way around the world, but the most sensible ways are either uh, going uh, through the Northwest Passage, as, as Fran showed, or you could take the long way around and go through the Panama Canal. But that's about 4,000 miles uh, longer. So it makes sense that the Coast Guard would want to take the shortcut. But why did they, did they need me in a, a science program? Why didn't they just go there? Well, the answer to that lies in an issue. And that's the fact that Canada considers the Northwest Passage as internal waters. And this means that they consider that they have the right to control the transit through the Northwest Passage, that you have to ask permission and receive authorization from Canada to do that. The US on the other hand, and many other countries, I should say, consider the Northwest Passage to be an international strait where vessels have the right of uh, transit passage without requesting permission. And this has been uh, a long-standing disagreement between two good friends. I happen to live in Canada in uh, 1986 when uh, the Coast Guard sent the Polar Sea through the Northwest Passage as part of what they call a Freedom of Navigation Program or FANA. And this has been US policy since 1983. We've seen it exercised a number of times uh, in the Straits of Hormuz and in the South China Sea. The US actually goes through exercises to demonstrate what it recognizes 
as international straits. But in 1985, when the Polar Sea went through, the US did not ask for formal authorization. It did notify the government of Canada, but it didn't ask permission. And to be honest, I think the government of Canada thought that was okay. And it was again, two friends that agreed to disagree, but it created a huge public reaction. Again, I, I, I was a professor at Dalhousie University at the time. And I remember the headlines in the local papers. I tried to find them and I couldn't, I only found the McLean's uh, front cover story on this. But the headline in the, the Halifax uh, Tribune or whatever it was, was US invades Canada in giant bold letters. It really created a tremendous reaction. I think surprised the Mulroney government at the time and actually almost led to uh, the uh, a change in, in government. Uh, it really got very, very serious. So they paid a lot of attention to it. And within a couple of years, through diplomacy and pragmatism, a very small, this is the entire treaty was signed between the US and Canada, and we won't go looking at all of it. Let me just zoom in on the, the pertinent statements. And it basically says that in recognition of the opportunity to increase knowledge of the marine environment through research conducted during ice, break, uh, ice breaker voyages, shared interest in safe navigation, the U.S. and Canada developed cooperative procedures for this purpose. They agree to take advantage of their icebreaker navigation to develop and share research information in order to advance our understanding of the marine environment of the area. And here's the key statements. The government of Canada, the government of the United States pledges that all navigation by U.S. icebreakers within waters claimed by Canada to be internal will be undertaken with the consent of the, of the government of Canada. But at the same time, nothing in this agreement affects the respective positions of the governments of the United States and Canada on the law of the sea in this or other marine areas or their respective positions regarding third parties. So it was a very, very interesting treaty that basically said, well, if you're gonna do research and ask permission, we'll do that, but we won't. We won't, we won't compromise our, our respective positions about internal waters or international straits. And so my suspicion, I really don't know this, is this is why we were asked to add to this transit of the Healy from Seattle to Greenland through the Northwest Passage, a science component. And so we went through the process as we do under the Law of the Sea Treaty with respect to requesting permission to do marine scientific research. We had to get consent from the government of Canada, the government of Denmark and Greenland, and the territory of Nunavut with, through three separate agencies. So that, and uh, we did that. We did that. It was time consuming. It wasn't simple, but it was done with great cooperation, collaboration, and eventually we were granted all those permissions. And so we were able to set off. Franchot did this beautiful picture, and I'll show you lots of nice pictures taken by John Farrell, the executive director of the Arctic Research Commission. Um, and here we are getting ready to go from Seward. Um, and as I said, this was a very different mission. All the other missions I had on the Healy, the State Department or NOAA or NSF pays for the Healy time to do the science mission. And so we really have control over what that mission looks like. This was what was called the science accommodation mission. So in this mission, we were not paying for the science time. We were invited on board to conduct, to conduct to conduct science, but to do it without interfering with the Coast Guard mission. And part of the mission was to get to Greenland as quickly as they could. And so we were basically uh, said, you're welcome to do science as long as you don't interfere with the mission. But we weren't paying for it, so that's not unreasonable. And so from my perspective, which was mapping, much of the Northwest Terror, uh, Passage is not mapped at all. Anything in the northern route we collect is important to safe navigation. So there was lots of wonderful science we can do on um, getting there. And we learn things about the seafloor as we go. But the Coast Guard was wonderfully accommodating because even in the areas that are highly mapped, all this color here is areas that we've mapped, the dark, the black are areas unmapped. The Coast Guard laid down a route, that gray route there, and they allowed us to deviate from that route. So we would maximize the amount of unmapped area, filling gaps as we went along. So this was a wonderful accommodation, just allowing us those diversions to fill gaps rather than taking the most direct route. 
With respect to the other science we did, here's John uh, manning the mapping station. We also had a, a bunch of other what we call underway science. So we had a team from uh, the National Geospatial Agency who were testing new gravimeters, measuring their gravity field and collecting for the first time a line that connected the East and the Western Arctic through the Northwest Passage. We had a team from Oregon State University using wonderful little, uh, almost miraculous uh, um, isotope measurement machines that can every five seconds uh, do an analysis. In Laura's case here, measuring oxygen and nitrogen, looking at a proxy for productivity. So looking at the changes in productivity in the water. A colleague of ours who actually couldn't do it automatically had to filter water coming through the hull again uh, and actually filter. So he only got to make 500 measurements through the whole cruise while, while Laura and others made 10 million measurements. Another team from the University of Alaska measuring other isotopes that gave us indications of changes in the CO2 system, changes in evaporation. So again, all these things that are changing so rapidly in the Arctic were able to monitor underway and we had an outreach component too. So as we go through the Northwest Passage, there, there are many routes that could be chosen. There are about seven routes that have been uh, transited so far since the Goya and its first cruise uh, by Roald Amundsen in 1903. 313 vessels have made that complete transit. The Coast Guard hoped to take the northernmost route. Only three vessels have done that, uh, and nobody has done it from the west to east. Uh, but as you'll see in a minute, the ice was so heavy that we actually had to uh, deviate uh, to the south of Banks Island here, come up through Prince of Wales Strait, and you'll see that, and then join that, that route for the rest of the way. And as I'll explain, it wasn't that the ice is too heavy for the Healy. The Healy could have gotten through, but we had some time constraints. Uh, and given those time constraints, um, we had to take the more judicious route uh, to get us there a little quicker. So you see here, and, and it's at this, this scale, barely, you could see the mapping we did as the water gets deeper in the Canada Basin, that swath gets wider, very shallow in the Bering Straits. But all of this mapping, adding new information about the nature of the seafloor, and again, adding information for safety of navigation as we travel through. And you see we came south of Banks Island here. The reason for that, now you're looking at satellite images. This is all ice up here. Here's Banks Island. And the Healy wanted to come up here head north or along the northern part of Banks Island, but all this very, very heavy ice would have just delayed us too much because we had to get to Resolute for a rendezvous with the Commandant of the Coast Guard and the Commandant of the uh, Canadian Coast Guard too, or the Commissioner of the Canadian Coast Guard. So instead the Healy uh, took an ice-free route here. You can see the ice edge here and south of Banks Island, it was ice-free and up through Prince of Wales Strait. The ice is a wonderful, uh, Haven and habitat for marine mammals um, and all kinds of other cool things. And John has some wonderful pictures of as we came to the ice edge walruses. And as we got deep in the ice, we had a number of encounters with polar bears. And so that just always makes for the, for the expedition, um, the excitement of the expedition. Coming through uh, the Prince of Wales Strait, you see very shallow, so a very narrow swath. But again, this map now will assure that there's yet another passage of safe navigation. Uh, coming through. You can see where it gets wider, the, the water is getting deeper. Um, coming through that narrow passage gave us the opportunity to see the shore because most of the times we were too far from shore to see it and really see the beautiful uh, topography and ge geology that surrounds um, the Northwest Passage. Into what's called uh, Viscount Melville Sound and back into some very, very heavy ice. To look at that ice, we had a deviate uh, from our desired route to get to Resolute um, and it slowed us down, but we got there early enough um, to leave us a little extra time to do a special survey that I'll show you in a minute, just to give you an idea of what that heavy ice looks at at night. But even in this heavy ice, this was all mostly first year ice uh, that's um, heavy, but, but not that thick. Throughout this entire trip, we collaborated with the Canadian Hydrographic Service and the Canadian government who gave us their desired routes, where they wanted to see safe navigation passages mapped. And we always tried to stay in there to get that. Occasionally, as what happened around here, we would uh, get diverted by the ice and couldn't stay in the path they wanted. But when we did get to Resolute a, a, a few hours early, we were able to do a nice detailed survey. And this is the kind of stuff that they can then be assured they have a safe navigation route between these two islands. Coming into uh, Resolute, we, we didn't get off the ship. Uh, we were met uh, by the Commandant of uh, 
the Coast Guard, Admiral Schultz, uh, came, who came on board by helicopter with the commissioner of the Canadian Coast Guard and a Canadian Coast Guard vessel, uh, Amundsen, where the Canadian and U.S. Uh, Coast Guards did a joint search and rescue op operation. So again, clearly an indication of the collaboration that went on in this cruise. Uh, coming out of Resolute through Lancaster Sound, getting a chance to go quite close to Devon Island and see the Devon Ice Cap and see the beautiful marine terminating glaciers um, coming out from the uh, ice cap, just as we see in Greenland on the other side. Um, and then into Baffin Bay, where we, we were able to do without stopping um, over a hundred of these, what we call expendable measurements of throwing a little probe over that measures the temperature, the salinity and the depth, giving us a wonderful indication of the oceanographic properties that were being used for the next cruise. So we set the scene for them. And then again, getting uh, coming into Nuke, uh, we had an extra day and we're able to do a very, very detailed survey for our colleagues at the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources. So we were able to do extra work for Greenland, extra work for Canada, and we were quite delighted again, hopefully promoting these good relations uh, with those countries. Um, into Baffin Bay where there are many, many spectacular icebergs. And for the first time, the whole trip, we actually had a couple of clear enough nights um, that uh, we got to see the Northern Lights. Finally, Nuke. Uh, where we spent a few days uh, before our flights out and had some wonderful hikes around there. And let me just end up by just giving a, a quick summary of what we were able to do on this just science accommodation mission. It was, it was just without interfering at all with the Coast Guard mission, we were able to collect more than 20,000 uh, square kilometers of seafloor mapped with special mapping for the Canadian Hydrographic Service and the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources providing lots of new information about safe navigation. We had the first continuous marine gravity across the Northwest Passage, more than 10 million uh, isotope measurements for um, ocean freshening, another 10 million isotope measurements to look at changes in the productivity and the poor fellow who had to actually take samples of, of the water filters, only 500 of those, but important ground truth for the productivity measurements. And then all our expendable probes, over hundred expendable probes looking at the water column property. And as I said, all of that with no interruption to the Coast Guard mission. And what I'm hoping is that this is gonna be a model for future icebreakers, for all vessels that operate uh, in these remote areas, that we can make these kind of measurements as we're underway um, and uh, collect very critical information for looking at the rapid changes in the Arctic. So let me end there uh, and thank you for your attention and see if we have any questions. Thank you very much. That was tremendous. So, Fran, Fran, I'm having a little trouble hearing you. So, if you can get a little closer to the microphone, that would be best. I'm just saying thank you very much. We all learned a lot from that, both about the technology that you have used and about the So Daniel, if you're there, I'm not hearing Fran at all. And it was, what about now? Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. You we don't go. have any in the chat at the moment. If you would like to. Leave. Any questions from anyone in this room? Yeah. I think she was first. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, a really, really insightful. Uh, just checking. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Oh, fantastic. So, uh, Lisa Sandman, as I mentioned before, I'm grown up in Denmark and therefore particularly interested in, in the dynamic between, of course, Greenland and, and how that interacts on the mission. But what I, what I wanted to ask was if you've seen a difference in how the scientific results have been received because it was done duly with a U.S. Coast Guard mission, especially in terms of the kind of Arctic tensions and, and the interaction between science and, and the diplomacy in the Arctic. So with respect to how the data are received by the the other countries, the other coastal yes. states. Um, not no, because we go through the standard process of uh, permitting through MSR, and that's through the through the, through our State Department, and then individually with uh, the entities I I mentioned, and so they have a series of expectations 
in terms of how we provide data for them or what data we will provide for them. They're very explicit about that. Um, in this case, and I think this is why our team kind of came on board, we've had very close relationships with uh, those countries uh, for years and worked very closely with uh, both our Greenland colleagues and the Canadian Hydrographic Service uh, and the Canadian Geologic Survey. And so I think they, they absolutely trusted the fact that we will provide all those data. I, I will do it by the end of the month, which is months and months ahead of time. I kind of have a year or so to provide it, but they'll get it all by the end of the month. We, we sent the Canadians um, the outlines of where we were surveying as we were doing it so that their vessel, the uh, Amundsen, which was going in the other direction, wouldn't duplicate it. It's so precious to get mapping data up there that they wanted to make sure they didn't duplicate it. So duplicate what we were doing. So we would send them just outlines of where we went so they would know offset. So I think it had no effect that we were on a Coast Guard vessel at all in terms of the data that we collected. Um, and I think uh, you know, with, the, with the, the typical kind of science to science relationships, uh, we, we uh, carry on very well. If I answered your question. Uh, thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Larry, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, and um, looking at all this geopolitics, especially related to continental shelf and Russia, uh, particularly, I was wondering if there is some sort of cooperation uh, in terms of scientists for um, uh, exchange of data uh, when you do the mapping. And also other like kind of potential cooperation in terms of using Russian icebreakers as Russia is actually having this activity uh, along the North, Northern Sea Route. Yeah, Thank this you. is yeah, yeah. That that's a that's a, a very sad question in my in my mind. Um, most of the Arctic states who have collected data, uh, we have a we have a. Uh, a project called uh, IPCAL, the International Bathymetric Chart of the Arctic Ocean. All of the data we've collected uh, in support of our ECS efforts uh, gets contributed to that um, as soon as we can. Uh, our colleagues in uh, most of the other Arctic states have contributed their data to help us build a, a, a publicly available map of the Arctic. Sadly, our Russian colleagues have not been contributing their data. And, um, for years, the Russians collected that kind of single beam data, but uh, in support of their very extensive uh, ECS efforts, they've collected some wonderful um, multi-beam sonar data that would be a tremendous addition to the, to the international database, but th they've not yet chosen to, to make that available. And something we, we continue to ask them, um, but we, we haven't gotten a positive response yet. So we're... We're kind of sad about that, um, for sure. Um, we also, even just this morning, had a meeting with our State Department colleagues because we're concerned about uh, the fact that um, under the law, the sea uh, marine scientific research uh, regime, a coastal state is required to ask permission to do marine scientific research uh, within a, another coastal state's EEZ. Um, and, and sadly, our Russian colleagues have not been uh, terribly forthright in granting that permission for the EEZ. We've had, uh, oh, I think, uh, I think John Farrell knows better, since 2014 or so, uh, no, no requests approved. And often they're just not responded to. Um, and the scary part is that same regime of, of needing to ask permission will extend to the extended continental shelf. And uh, if the Russian submission is, uh, given a positive uh, approval by the commission for the limits of the continental shelf, uh, almost half the Arctic will be Russian extended continental shelf. And we're quite concerned that we may be in that same situation. So it's not a, it's not a very, very pretty picture right now with respect uh, to uh, the sharing of data uh, and uh, access to uh, research uh, in, in some parts of the Arctic. We have one question from Zoom, and then we can turn it over uh, back to the room. So Evan from Zoom says, uh, you briefly mentioned outreach work that happened as part of the expedition. Can you elaborate on that? What did it involve, and what were the goals? Yeah, we, just, we had a young, a very young uh, scientist who originally uh, was coming to do a science program, but uh, um, for one reason or other, that science program um, didn't come to fruition. 
Uh, and so he he turned role his role into that of an outreach. He uh, created uh, blogs. They weren't they weren't live streamed because of issues with bandwidth and things like that. But I think he recorded them uh, for for later for later uh, broadcast. And uh, you probably can look him up if you're interested under under the name Arctic Andy. Great. Yeah, you had a photo of Arctic Andy highlighting the podcast in your presentation. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for including that. Wonderful. Do you want to go ahead and ask the next question? Oh, uh, Adam Schneider, I'm a first year MPP student, uh, a former Navy navigator. I uh, never had the chance to sail off into the Arctic, so I'm very jealous seeing all your photos. Um, but uh, my question is, you know, over the next 30 years, uh, the, the Northwest Passage is expected to become ice free enough to be, you know, an economically viable trade route. Uh, I was wondering what scientific gaps you see that need to be filled in before that time when we can have you know, consistent merchant navigation through those straits, through those waters. And uh, what, what kind of support the scientific community needs from the U.S. government if this accommodation mission is enough or if they need more direct uh, research mission support for it? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, certainly, I don't think anybody would contend that uh, we have enough mapping information um, to assure lots of traffic, safe navigation um, through the Northwest Passage. So, so just the fundamental seafloor mapping fr from a safety and navigation perspective, we certainly need more of that. Um, from a scientific perspective, um, I think that the, the the Northwest Passage becomes this intriguing region where we're on the boundary of a lot of different systems. And I think it, it has the potential to, to really look at an acceleration of lots of changes of, of melt water from um, terminating glaciers, uh, of river runoff and things like that. And so we, we, we might look at it very much as a region of acceleration of changes that uh, will help us uh, predict what we might be seeing in the rest of the Arctic and then from the rest of the Arctic um, globally. So I think there are a number of these kinds of scientific programs like those established. Now, the, the next question you ask is, can it all be accomplished in science accommodation missions? And I think the answer is absolutely not. We need dedicated science cruises too. I think the idea of the, the science accommodation mission is wonderful, as an add-on to existing programs, because it really is, is a very small incremental cost. Uh, and, and certainly as we demonstrated, uh, puts very little stress on the mission of, of the icebreaker. But I would not like to see that to be the only mechanism. We have to be able to design programs that go where it's most important for us uh, from the science community to answer those, answer those science questions. Hi, Larry, Gemma Holt. Um, and Fran, you may also have insight into this question, but I wondered if you could comment on the political implications of this mapping work, um, if it is leveraged to expand the U.S. continental shelf, given that the United States is not um, a signatory to the Convention on the Law of the Sea. Yeah, so let, let me start with the U.S. Well, we actually, I think, and I saw, I saw Ambassador Bolton there, he'll correct me if I'm wrong. I think we actually did uh, sign the treaty. It just it hasn't gotten uh, ratification from the, from the, yeah. uh, from the Senate. Um, but I, I would also say that the U.S. was a major player in the negotiation of the treaty. And that I think we have accepted most of the treaty uh, as customary international law. We certainly follow the tenets of the treaty. And so given, given the, the very strange political situation that, that has prevented the Senate's uh, advice and consent for the treaty, I think everybody else is just marching full ahead saying we will abide by the tenets of the treaty and we are going to make a uh, submission um, and establish the limits of our continental shelf um, as we can do through international customary law. Um, so I think with that approach, we um, are doing our mapping. We're 
going through all the proper processes. We're creating quite a large uh, submission that documents all this. Uh, it will be submitted to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. Um, and uh, so we're just going through the process with blinders on basically to the fact that, that uh, we, we don't have the advice and consent of the Senate because it's recognized as international customary law, particularly the establishment of uh, a continental shelf. So that was part of your question. And, and was there another component to it that I avoided? No, no, that was great. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I will just add something very briefly. Um, in all of the international Arctic Council and, and similar entities that have held conferences that Larry and I have gone to for years, and Doug too, it almost always comes up. Why hasn't the U.S. taken the final step and ratified the treaty? And it's, it's kind of a strange answer. The answer, the honest answer is, the U.S. Senate hasn't been ratifying any treaties. And I'm not so sure it's as specific to this one as it is more generally to this notion that perhaps, you know, the U.S. doesn't have to join forces with other nations. Personally, I remain hopeful that at some point the U.S. Senate will ratify this treaty because, as you probably also know, there has been Republican and Democratic support. There has been support from industry wanting the certainty associated with it. And so the argument against it, which has been sort of about the taxation of potential deep sea mining development and whether or not the shared taxation structure was fair in the US or not, seems to me, and, and it always has, as a pretty irrational argument because something, a, a percentage of something is better than a percentage of nothing. <laughs> which is sort of where you're at if you don't really have the extended continental shelf and you can't really do anything with it uh, in terms of your own jurisdiction. So it's sort of a strange um, argument that has led to the resistance, but I would say that the good news is Larry and his team and other scientists have continued to march on and have done the science necessary to really understand our extended continental shelf. And if and when, when we are actually able to present the claim and have the science behind it, and hopefully legitimately with the treaty ratified, as opposed to right now, which is this sort of gray zone of whether or not it would be accepted even if we didn't officially ratify it, which is a whole other legal argument. Um, I am at least grateful that Larry and his team and the US Coast Guard and the government has funded as much as it has to position us for that eventuality. So we have pretty much run out of time. I just want to once again say thank you Larry very much for the presentation today and for sharing the slides and the history and putting into perspective the science, the multi-beam sonar technology that has advanced in literally the, just the last two decades, which is pretty phenomenal. And thank you for all of the research work that you have done in the Arctic. And for those of you who are actually on campus as opposed to online, I just wanna make sure that you know that Professor Henry Lee, who is also part of the Arctic Initiative, joined us a little bit late. And, and also Doug Gauzy, the senior fellow, who is going to be here in residence for the rest of this fall, even though I'm going to be leaving shortly, Doug will be here. And if you want to do follow up, I'm sure he'd be happy to as well. So with that, thank you, Larry, very much. Take good care. See you at the next science meeting, the next Arctic meeting. <laughs> and for all of us who joined us online this evening, thank you very much for joining us. Take thank care. you, Brian. Thank you all. Danny, thank you so much for managing, <laughs> which I think that was a little more complicated than we thought.